Hello, everyone. I am Daniel Fish from Historic Peverly. Today, we will be talking about brown bass muskets that are in the Historic Beverly Collection. First, a basic introduction on the spotlight of this presentation. During the talk, I will be switching between viewing the object and sharing some slides. And I will try to let you know when I am about to switch as there may be a slight delay during transition. We're going to move on to our first slide. What are muskets? Muskets emerged as a firearm during the 1500s. They became widely popular across the globe as they turned into a commonly used weapon in warfare. They were used heavily in Europe, and as a result, there were several, several variations on the initial design that occurred during their development. They are traditionally smooth bore weapons, meaning that they have no rifling or grooves on the inside of the barrel. This rifling would make anything fired from a gun more accurate as it put a spin on any bullets coming out. Now, I'm going to share my screen in full so you can see the musket. The, this brown vest musket was used in the Revolutionary War by Noah Cressy, a longtime resident of Beverly. During this talk, we will be discussing Noah Cressy, and we will also be dis talking about the musket and how it has changed over the years, along with examining its ammunition and how American soldiers came into using this British firearm. Let's talk a little bit about the owner. Noah Cressy was born on August 24th, 1710, and married Sarah Trask, on May 5th, 1759. He had two sons, Jonathan and Nathan, and was a member of the Second Congregational Church in Beverly. He was an American soldier during the Revolutionary War, at which point he would have been 65 years old when it began. Noah Cressy owned this rifle until his passing on October 5th, 1784. Now, I want to go over some of the basics of a musket with you. I'm going to start moving the camera, and you may see my hands in frame as well. Just keep this in mind as I am picking it up. We're moving to the back of the gun right here. So here we have the butt and the stock of the musket. Traditionally, the brown vest would have brass fittings on both locations, as you can see here and here, as well as this plating here. It is also said that the uh, trigger guard is also brass. Uh, we will now move around a little bit so we can look at the trigger mechanism. So we set this up right here. There we go. Now, I want to direct your attention to the trigger and the firing mechanism of this rifle. It's right here for the trigger guard and right here for the trigger where my finger is resting. Here we have the trigger, which sets into motion the firing mechanism just above it called the flintlock system. A flintlock system uh, involves a piece of flint stuck between the jaws uh, right here that are connected to this hammer. In this scenario, if you were to fire a musket, you would first need to put a small amount of measured gunpowder into the pan right here, 
you would then clamp down this piece of steel called a frizzen. This would cover the pan, protecting it from both weather conditions and as you move the rifle to stuff down ammunition. Uh, when there's powder in the pan, this would keep it covered. And then the hammer right here would be pulled all the way back as to fully cock it. Usually the hammer would have a piece of flint in the jaws. Um, however, this particular model does not as it's missing. Pulling the trigger would spring this flint forward towards the pan, sparking against the steel of the frizzen and igniting the gunpowder. This exposed the pan and allowed the sparks of the flint against the steel to ignite. Once lit, the gunpowder causes a small explosion behind the ammunition and pushes the musket ball, propelling it forward down the length of the barrel and exiting through the muzzle of the gun. These particular muskets were accurate up to 100 yards. Now I'm going to pull it back a little bit. Might be a little blurry, but there we go, we focused. I'm going to share my slideshow again with you. And we were going to move on to our next slide as we discuss different types of muskets. Because, because they have been around for hundreds of years, muskets have changed and adapted depending on the countries and people who use them in combat. From the 1500s to early 1600s, the more common style of musket was called a matchlock. These used an adjustable match or fuse to ignite the powder, which in turn uh, turned out to be a fairly inefficient way of firing a musket. This is due to the high risk of water soaking the exposed gunpowder, as well as dry gunpowder exploding if it was near a lit match or fuse. You can see an example of a match lock near the upper left hand corner. The hammer, the hammer similar to what you saw with the flintlock system, would hold the lit match and when pulled it would ignite the gunpowder set it off as it kind of fizzled and then fired. To the right, um, we see a musket type called a wheel lock, or it would use a firing mechanism as such that would need to be wound in order to fire. This allowed the hammer to strike against a rotating igniter, uh, and this is much more evident in later flintlock systems. These wheel locks did not catch on due to their expensive nature and need for small tools to wind up the spinning mechanism that could be easily lost. Starting in 1610 and up until the 1850s, muskets used primarily a flintlock system for setting off the packed powder and lead balls. Loading jams were common once the musket had been fired several times as gunpowder residue would build up on the inside of the barrel. As musket evolution continued into the Civil War, Civil War rifles and muskets tended to use uh, percussion caps or um, percussion cap um, igniters, which were a lot more stable and accurate, especially with the um, rifle boring of the muskets of the time. Now we are going to move on to slide four. Due to the difficulty of reloading measured amounts of gunpowder during combat, paper cartridge ammunition had been common for more than 100 years. This was beneficial as it was the right amount of gunpowder measured out along with the ammo and pieces of paper that it was used to pack it all down the barrel of the musket. A standard cartridge case, as we see to our left, was, was made primarily of a wood block with holes bored into them and then encased in leather. These could hold up to 21 paper cartridges and were rounded to conform to a soldier's hip. 
so you can see the slight bend in the wood. These steps followed in order to reload your musket would include the following. You would first tear off the top of the cartridge where the bullet would be located. With your teeth, usually, you would then pour out a small amount of gunpowder into the flash pan near the hammer before covering it with the frizzin. You would then upright your rifle and pour the rest of the gunpowder down the barrel of the musket. Using your ramrod, a thin metal rod, usually attached to the underside of the musket, you would drive the musket ball down and paper as well into the barrel, packing it tightly. This would make sure that the gunpowder could push the musket ball out and not um, pass around it. This paper help, helped with just the whole system of the gunpowder igniting, pushing that packed load through the muzzle and out. The average amount of rounds a soldier could fire, if skilled, would be three rounds per minute. With 21 rounds of ammo on a soldier, this would be roughly seven minutes in order to fire off all the rounds. However, this, would, this was uncommon due to the risk of misfiring as gunpowder residue built up and how close soldiers needed to be in order to fire their muskets and be accurate, most guns would have a bayonet on the end of the musket barrel. This allowed those that fired their muskets to charge the enemy once their rounds were fired and engage in close combat. You can see on the middle of the slide, we have an example of a ramrod. That is the one taken from the rifle that you see here, the musket you see here. And to your right, you can see a paper cartridge with all its separate components, the musket ball, the gunpowder on the paper, and then what a fully composed paper cartridge would look like. We are then going to move on to our next slide. Now, what is a brown bass? Brown bass is the nickname for a flintlock British land pattern musket. The brown bass nicknamed itself after the uniform color that the rifle has with its walnut wood. However, there are rumors of its origin, such as being named after Queen Elizabeth I, as well as some uh, workers within the, within the city of London. The specific style of the one you see here is a long land pattern musket, which was standard issue from 1722 until 1793. Long land pattern muskets tended to have brass fittings on the butt, stock, and trigger guard. This style of musket was constructed in England and kept at an armory. The location of which armory these muskets were from were stamped into the metal plate on the stock of the gun to the left of the hammer. Noah Cress's musket, as you see at the top of this slide, would have been stored in Dublin Castle. The bottom musket, a second model brown best, was kept at the Tower of London. Be moving on to our next slide. Now, the big question is, how did Noah Cressy end up with a British brown vest? In the most common method, he likely acquired it by taking it from a dead British soldier or received it after it was stolen from a British supply shipment. This was usually done through privateers, such as Hugh Hill, who we also have a spotlight presentation on. Colonial American muskets were not produced on as large of a scale as British firearms, as materials and staff were difficult to come by in order to produce these muskets for tens of thousands of soldiers. This would also be a risk if you were caught making muskets for the Continental Army. Because of this, they had to make do with what they could steal, scavenge, and create on their own terms. It would not be until 1778 when the French became allies with the colonies, but a French supply of muskets 
make their way into the colonies and into the hands of the Continental Army. Now, if there are any questions, you can feel free to contact me at research at historicbeverly.net or feel free to browse any items you saw here in our collection at beverlyhistory.pastperfectonline.com. Image of the matchlock musket could be found at Wikipedia. An imagery of the wheel lock musket can be found at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's a free use. We hope you enjoyed the spotlight presentation. That you'll come visit Historic Beverly. Have a good day.